four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, the show where two friends, two old friends, get together and watch an episode of Transformers Generation 1 and then sit down together to talk about that episode. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hoover. I am still Hoover. You are neither a cartoonist nor a teaching artist. Neither. Not both. So I'm <laughs> not both and i'm not either one neither i am just a guy you are a transformers enthusiast transformers enthusiast you could put that uh, below my name on the chiron decepticon booster so we're back for episode seven which means we're going to talk about fire in the sky man mm. this one i feel is a very rich episode for me anyway it has all it has everything i want out of a transformer story it's got an imaginative fight scene it's got a lot of characters interacting we learn a little bit about everybody's worldview through a few lines of dialogue and we have some fairly rich and interesting character development but what sunbow does so well and I feel like this is completely out of fashion nowadays because like, and I, I'll point to the parts where it's like, okay, this is the part where a modern cartoon would go further. They hint at growth, but never deliver on growth, mm. right? Like in this episode, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, spoil this out ahead of time, but in, in the spirit of uh, intriguing people to stick around, we're going to talk a lot about Starscream and <laughs> we're going to talk about how this episode, we get to see a warmer side of Starscream. We actually find out that he is not full on sociopath that there's more to him <laughs> than than just like what would you say like single minded greed and power hunger there's something else clanking around in that brain of his and it points to the fact that the guy has real affections and real hang ups but mm. you know we, we, well i'm going to make my case later on but like i just feel like in in modern cartoons they would deliver on that he would grow in one direction or the other but in right. this one, it's like they just like leave him right where he started. <laughs> but like yeah. you said in ep episode zero, one of the things that 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 is makes that interesting for you is like it gives you just enough to speculate. Like with Thundercracker mm -hmm. and Skywarp, they, there's not a whole lot. We don't get a whole lot out right. of those characters in the show, but just enough to make you wonder and, and start to, to develop your own personal canon. Right. Exactly. Just enough to get the fanfic a moving. And, and I mean, this is why I think that the show really connected with young people, too, is I've always made the case that it didn't need to do any more than what it was. It was a commercial, right? Mm -hmm. And it set up just enough story to get us to go home, to take our toys at home and begin imagining more adventures with them and imagining what directions we would take things. Mm -hmm. So in, in a certain way, I would argue that this series, more so than modern cartoons, is less didactic. It's less telling us what the characters are and more suggesting what the characters could be hmm. which has its own charm you have to whip so, out the big words this early in the day what didactic yes that just means to teach people it means being instructive i know what it means <laughs> but it doesn't mean you have to use the the five dollar words already and this is the part where hoover plays the role of ultra magnus and i play the part of perceptor so <laughs> Getting way ahead of us. Well, I do enjoy this episode quite a bit. Uh, I wouldn't say it's one of my absolute favorites because there's no random purple seekers in it, but yeah. uh, Thundercracker and Skywarp do both get lines, so that does place it pretty high on my generic rating scale. And Reflector does an inexplicably strange and cute thing. In oh, this yeah, one. totally. <laughs> Which is on screen for like maybe two seconds. But I, but I really love it. <laughs> it makes no sense. But like it again, it, it excites the imagination going like, okay, Reflector had a conversation with himself just before he did that. <laughs> like, this is my moment. We've been practicing this, everybody. This is what we came here for. <laughs> Let's do this thing. All right. Enough of the teasing. Let's talk about the episode synopsis. Episode seven, Fire in the Sky by Alfred A. Pegal. P-E-G-A-L. I think I pronounced that right. Synopsis. While draining the Earth of its heat down at the Arctic Circle, the Decepticons stumble across an old friend of Starscream's, Skyfire, frozen in the ice. But will Skyfire be able to do what is right? 
I, I like the idea of like ending a blurb with a question, like like mm. this is the decision the characters have to make. But what's how is he? What does he have to decide between? Okay, we'll find out. <laughs> so set us up. How does this one begin? Well, we see the familiar rear of the arc sticking out of the mountain as we often do, but now instead of being surrounded by tan deserty colors, it's snowing. So it's surrounded mm-hmm. by white. That's something mm-hmm. we don't usually see. And Spike standing out front, he's, he comments that that the he's looking at the largest snowman he's ever seen. But it's not a snowman. It's a snow bot. It's Jazz covered in snow. And we learn that with all the downtime Jazz has had by not being yeah. second in <laughs> command anymore, he's put a lot of thought into snow puns. Yeah, and and he evidently stood in the snow waiting for it to pile onto him like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's got a like lot of since, free time now. Ever since Prime demoted him. Uh, I also noticed there was a, a cute little animation error in the very, very first three seconds of this episode where the snow was falling upward. Yeah. It's like they... Did you catch that too? Yeah, maybe, maybe it's breezy, but uh, probably <laughs> not. I mean, it's like gently drifting upward. It's weird. But then like the the next time, once you see Spike, the snow's falling in the proper direction. But yeah, it's it's a flurry in a hurry. And Spike responds with his own. Is it a pun when he says I get the drift? I guess so. Yeah, just shakes all the snow that's onto him down onto Spike, who says he gets the drift. Oh, uh, Spike would be fun to hang out with. Jazz at least thought it was funny. Or did well, he? Maybe. He, because he laughs, but he laughs with Cliff Jumper's voice. Huh. Are you sure that's Cliff Jumper? I mean, I, I listened to that twice. It could and be I Blue Streak's voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, I just wonder wrote. If, like, I, wonder, I wonder if, like, just Scatman Crowther is this forced fake laugh just happens to sound a lot like Casey Kasem. Mm, it really sounded like Casey Kasem to me. Yeah, it did. But Spike will have his revenge. He has Bumblebee, Cliff Jumper, Ratchet, and Hound all pelt jazz with snowballs. And here we see they're definitely in the southwestern USA. There's cactuses under the snow, and they don't grow yep. anywhere else, apparently. Well, yeah, so saguaro so, so cacti, at least, only grow in the southwest United States, as far as I understand. That Maybe maybe they grow some grow in northern Mexico. Like before, in, in the first miniseries and in the early episodes when they would show the arc, it looked more wooded around the volcano, which mm-hmm. suggested that, oh, well, like, it could be that this is in like Utah or um, Nevada or something. But like the moment that you see that cactus, I don't think anybody was thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're like, we got to show it's desert. What? Cause like, there's some other shorthand coming up where I'm like, yikes, that's, that's some, that's some problematic shorthand. But like, it's like, what do kids think of when they think of the desert? Well, everybody's read peanuts. We've all seen Snoopy's brother spike who lives <laughs> in needles, California. And there's always saguaro cacti there. Therefore, Saguaro cacti means the south. They're in the desert, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is this is if you want to get persnickety and over analytical, which is the purview of this podcast, they are. This is clear evidence that they are in <laughs> either Southern California or Arizona. Okay, put a pin in that, people. <laughs> well, it's one of those things that I like about this show in that it points to that kind of like something similar to magical realism where it's like somebody made the case to me ages ago that the the appeal of Harry Potter is that it's a magical world that exists in parallel with the quote unquote real world. You could turn a corner at the train station, there could be the entrance to Hogwarts, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. part of the appeal of the show and this 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 toy line I think when we were kids was the fact they turned into cars that we could see on the road, right? Yeah. Like, you knew when you saw a Datsun drive by, like, oh, my gosh, that could be Blue Streak. That could be him. Mm-hmm. I never did see any Lamborghinis drive by, though. You know, I don't think I've ever seen one in the wild myself. I've seen it. I have now, now that I'm a grown-up. But uh, Oh, have you? But as a kid, no. Um, hmm. I, I, I've never sat down to do, like, a bingo checklist of all the Autobots <laughs> I've seen on the road. That's an interesting, Road interesting trip. <laughs> but anyway, like I, I also like it when it gets a little bit rooted in the real world. Like, for instance, in Transformers Animated, when it took place in Detroit, when I lived in Ann Arbor. And then when Optimus mm-hmm. said, let's let's take the I-94, I'm like, that's the freeway I drive on. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that I lived in Arizona as well, and I see the Saguaro Cactus, I'm like, oh, that's like, a, that's like at the park that I walked in. The Autobots could have been there. 
Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, there, there, there's still this cute playing going on where there's snowball fighting and the Autobots are slip sliding all over the snow and knock it into desert plants. So Jazz, Jazz managed to duck behind uh, all the, the snowballs headed his way. But the force of the snowballs knocks some snow down from a ledge above him, so he still gets coated in the snow. And then we see Bumblebee building a big snowball, and Spike tells Ratchet to watch out, but Bumblebee hates a rat, so he instead throws a snowball at Spike, and the force snaps Spike's neck. Spike slips, he dies, but we shall remember you, Spike. We shall remember. Now, I know in your personal fanfic that's how it ended, but in the cartoon, we get this rare moment where actually something kind of playful and joyful happens in this other way. Like, the last episode was like, factories are building weapons to stop the world's greatest threat. Evil, you know? And, like, now it's like, hey, it's a snowball fight, and Bumblebee throws a snowball, and that thing that we all wished we would we could do when we were children, how, did you ever do, well, you didn't live around snow very much when you were a kid, mm-hmm. did you? When I was a kid, I experienced snow for literally uh, maybe three times. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my heart breaks for you. Because it, this is like a fundamental experience of being a kid in the Midwest is a you know big, heavy snow day like what they're showing at the beginning of this episode and rolling snowballs down a hill, praying that it will turn into that Disney Donald Duck cartoon giant snowball that in, you know pulls everything in the world into it. But that's what happens here is the snowball rolls down a hill. It hits Spike. Spike rolls down the hill. He turns into a giant snowball and he sucks up all the other Transformers into him and they hit a wall. <laughs> if you've ever played Katamari Damacy, that's that's exactly yeah. what this looks like. There's one <laughs> ball of snow with Spike. Then he runs into the Autobots and they form a bigger ball of snow. And then it keeps, keeps going down the hill. So this is a Christmas special then. It's the closest Transformers ever got to a, an animated Christmas special. Christmas in July, maybe. Yeah, because all that's needed for a Christmas special is snow. <laughs> well, no, it's just like the next line is that Spike's like, ah, I can't believe I'm having a snowball fight in July in the middle of the desert. It's amazing. And we pull back and we see that Optimus is watching them on the Teletran 1. And Optimus has his own thoughts on that, is that it's perhaps dangerous. Mm-hmm. This is uh, this is the prime where we've arrived at, kids. This is not John Wayne, crazy prime. This is worried about everything in the world, prime. The what do you call it when you're the leader and you have to think about all these horrible things? Responsibility. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> he's got that R word. <laughs> You know that th- that that feeling that I have absolutely no contact with <laughs> or mm-hmm. relationship with. I, I, I'm actually like I'm co-hosting with Ben Katz of Doctor Katz. Everybody, <laughs> hey everybody. <laughs> he's he, right after the show. He's going to order some pot-bellied pigs. Ben. Oh God. Hey Ben. Daddy. Did you go back to sleep? What? Did I wake you up? Did you go back to sleep? What time is it? It's it's ten after nine. I went back to sleep. What do you mean? You get up, you had have, have breakfast, and then you go back to sleep. What do you call me right when you get to work? No, but like, so what, what's he? Why? What's he do with his worry? Does he just sit and like you know like wring his hands and and mutter to himself? <laughs> well, he asked Teletran to figure out the reason for all this unexpected snow, <laughs> and Teletran explains that the whole planet is experiencing colder temperatures, and. Prime deducts from this that the heat energy from the Earth's core is somehow being drained away, uh, which is a bit of a leap, but okay. Or maybe he read it off the screen and we just didn't see the words, but that's fine. (laughs) So apparently the Earth's core, its heat is being drained away. I wonder how that could be happening. Well, this is this is another one of those things where I'm always going to argue that as long as it makes sense to kids then Mm -hmm. and it's fine you know like i feel like there's there's this perilous line and like we celebrate and 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 joke in a loving way about the inconsistencies of the show but i just want to like underline one more time is that like you know who asks how superman can fly oily teenagers who think they've got the world figured out (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> like the kid working at TCBY who's like, ugh. <laughs> He's the guy who's like, yeah, lame. Or what was the kid, your cousin, who was like, oh, yeah. uh, uh, you can't lift a car in cops. Well, right. I just, it just happened. So anyway, episode zero, everybody. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a weird idea. It's like if you suck the heat out of the Earth's core, the Earth will cool. Maybe I don't know. I'd have to talk to a geologist on that one. <laughs> By the way, while he's saying like the heat of the Earth is being drained away, there's this slow pan across Autobot headquarters to where Gears is sitting, and Gears is sitting at another monitor. And it's another one of those things I just want to highlight for people who want to watch carefully. Is this is one of those neat background paintings where they show that like the mountain is smashed into the arc. Like, it's yeah. not just this pristine Autobot base. It's like, Prime's in front of a functional monitor, panned by three computer screens that are smashed out with rocks protruding through them, and then Gears is at another small uh, monitor uh, on the other wall. So, this is a, another visual thing that I love about this first season, is that Autobot base is not... I mean, it's a technological marvel, but it's still in a cave, right? Mm -hmm. It's both. And hey, of everyone, it's our buddy Gears. Yeah. I, I didn't remember that he was so prominent in this episode. <laughs> he, he does have a couple of lines. Oh, and this is where we get to the other problematic shorthand. Uh, well, this is the earlier shorthand wasn't as problematic, but this is like he's looking at what is clearly like probably supposed to be a Polynesian island <laughs> on his screen. And this Polynesian island is covered in snow. It's like palm trees covered in snow. But then it's like, are there cars? Are there buildings? No, it's huts. It's Robinson Caruso. <laughs> As primitive as can be. Yes, he's looking at Gilligan's Island. And <laughs> what if it? What if it was? What if he was just watching Gilligan's Island? Yeah, like it's just it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I know what they were probably thinking was is like, well, we need kids to understand that this is, but like at the same time, it's like I'm sure there were kids in Hawaii who were watching, going like, I don't see any grass huts around me. We've got <laughs> buildings and cars and streets. Oh, we've got electricity. <laughs> well, we don't know where he was looking. I'm sure there's huts without electricity somewhere in the world. Somewhere, probably. But yeah, it, it, it struck me as funny watching it again as a grown up. But but yeah, so what, what is Gears thinking about? He's like, oh, let's go on a vacation to this Polynesian island. <laughs> well, Gears remarks that the Decepticons must be behind this, which is a pretty uh, pretty logical thought process at this point. At this point in the series, if there's anything going wrong, it's pretty much Megatron at fault here. Yeah. So, and, and Gears is almost like calling upon the transition music to take us to the next scene. <laughs> right? I wonder if they're behind this. Let's see. We go to the Arctic <laughs> Circle, and a giant green crystal is blasting through the ice, and then we hear the John Travolta of the Decepticons speak. <laughs> Yeah, we, we hear a familiar scuzzy voice, and it's Skywarp. And uh, interestingly enough, he's yelling at Rumble, who is further into the cave where they're standing, like a ice cave or ice tunnel or some sort of thing like that. So we get uh, Frank Walker arguing with himself, which <laughs> might be why Rumble doesn't really have many lines here. Maybe they didn't want to uh, make it overly noticeable. Yeah. Rumble is just like juvenile Skywarp, right? Mm hmm. Rumble just reads like Skywarp like 10 years ago. It's like hip teen Skywarp. Skywarp's yeah. like 18, and Rumble's <laughs> like 15 or something like that. Yeah, Skywarp's buying cigarettes now. Right. <laughs> <And> Rumble is <laughs> stealing them. Yeah, it's like the difference between a, a junior high kid and a, and a high schooler. Yeah. In, in this, the interaction here, okay, this is where we go to that Sunbow thing where they just give you enough to hint at things to make you wonder. And like the fact that Skywarp is like teasing Rumble because Rumble's got his pile drivers out and he's trying to, you know, pound through the ice. And Skywarp's like, oh, it's big, bad ice too tough for you. And it almost like it makes you wonder, like, I wonder if there, you could have done something with a big brother, little brother kind of relationship with these two. Mm. Like, how, how cool would an episode be where, like, that rivalry is kind of amped up a little bit, but then Rumble gets into, like, in over his head or something, and Skywarp's like, well, he's still a Decepticon, and I have to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I bail out my fellow Decepticon. Yeah. That could have been a fun thing to do with those two. And, and this moment, like, gives you the slightest suggestion that that is a possibility, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's 
it's rare that the two interact, but this there's this one, and I think another one is coming up in the next few episodes. But uh, oh, that's we'll right, that's that. right. He gives Frenzy a hard time, and that's <laughs> one of the rare times we get to see Frenzy. Um, Who's Frenzy? Yeah, I know. I, well, Frenzy is red, Rumble is blue, or is Frenzy <laughs> blue, Rumble is red? Oh no! Let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Email us at four million years later at gmail dot com. <laughs> um, also, I noticed. This is the first instance of the new Transformer footstep noise. Uh oh. Up until this point, it's been the more gravelly, lower registered, crumbly sound. And now it is more of a clanking noise when they walk, which is weird because like they're walking on snow. But I wonder if if that has anything to do with it or if it just happens to, you know, have come along at this time. Like Where they like, hey, they're walking on snow now. Maybe we should change up the sound. I don't know. That would be an interesting story to hear. But my fear is that it'd be like so many cartoon conventions I go to where they're like, nah, we were just like trying to get a deadline and (laughs) (laughs) it just sounded good. (laughs) Too many times we're asking questions like, I wonder if they really put a lot of thought into Thundercracker's (laughs) actions here. And they're just like... Well, it was the first thing that came to mind when I was writing the script. So it's like some some of these questions are better not asked. Right. Right. If you want an aside, I, I find a successful strategy is to su- is to not ask it as a question, but to suggest that, mm. hey, I noticed this. I wonder if you did it on purpose. And then let them take credit for it. Because then they can go, right. yeah, I totally did. And then you get the satisfaction <laughs> of noticing something like greatness in work. And they get the satisfaction of the compliment and the recognition of their talent. <laughs> this is part of my f- series of jersey tips in talking to people who are famous in the cartoon world all right so we might need a jingle for that <laughs> it's a jersey tip so uh skywarp gives rumble like a little bit of a hard time and being a younger sibling rumble's reaction is absolutely appropriate he's like oh yeah i'll show you and he pounds <laughs> in the ice with all of his might and then also there's like an earthquake And this part is another lighthearted, cute part, right? What happens? Well, Rumble's little uh, pile driver arms have managed to create a little earthquake slash cave-in in in his little ice cave here. So Rumble hauls butt out of the cave in order to not get trapped within a cave-in. Because even though the Decepticons have a habit now of easily getting out of cave-ins, Rumble doesn't want to have to do that again. So he runs towards the front of the cave... And he and uh, Skywarp basically tumble and land into some snow. Well, I like how the, the avalanche covers up Rumble completely, but then it just covers up Skywarp up to his like his belt line. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's keep in mind Rumble's like six foot tall, if that. Yeah. And yeah. Skywarp's probably like, mm, I don't know, 18 foot tall, something like that. Something like that. So these guys just sort of got uh, KO'd by the snow, more or less, and in walks Starscream. Mm -hmm. Starscream, see you guys are just standing around, which is funny because they're both like laying down in the snow at this point. (laughs) And they found something. What did they find? Well, there's like this piece of metal sticking out of the ice. Yeah, like a pointy something. I don't really know what it's supposed to be. It almost looks like a finger, but bigger yeah i mean it, it almost, almost looks, looks like, like the, the nose cone of the jet mode but he's in robot mode so yeah it's not clear what this piece of skyfire is you don't I, I can't connect it to anything that's actually on him it almost looks like uh laser beak's beak mm-hmm. but white yeah so skywarp says oh, we found something and and megatron just happens to walk in on this and remarks you did and he thinks it looks like a robot and a big one And though it's still fully encased in ice, Megatron already has plans to draft this mystery robot into the Decepticon army. So we're going to make some notes here, everybody. Skyfire, we're not clear on how exactly how tall he is (laughs) because he changes (laughs) size dramatically. Yeah, yeah. They're not consistent with his size in this. He is roughly like three or four heads taller than Megatron or Optimus, like generally speaking. Mm -hmm. But... He I would say at his smallest, he's substantially larger than Primer Megatron. Right. And at his biggest, well, we'll we'll deal with that when we see it. But yeah, so Megatron has a one-track mind. Says so like, wow, he looks big and strong. Therefore, 
I, he'll, he'll make an excellent Decepticon. This scene, like I've talked about this before in some microcasts about Transformers. When I was a teenager in high school, I remember befriending some big dudes, like guys who were just like really tall and really thick, right? Mm -hmm. And like there was always... I saw this thing happen again and again where people just assumed that they were somehow a bruiser or that somehow they belonged mm -hmm. to the football team because of their size, you know? And like, as, and, and I knew them as like really gentle, creative people. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, like, one of the guys in particular, I remember people would like, like, they would give him the business and try to get him to fight them because they're like, well, he's so big. Of course, he's a fighter. But all he wanted to be was a special effects artist. So, like, his, his passion, like, what brought him to life was sitting in his bedroom, listening to Metallica and making latex scars. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't give a dang about personal confrontation that was not interesting to him you know so like whenever i encountered those guys i always thought of this story and how megatron is like well he's big we got to make him a warrior so <laughs> i like that about this episode too it's very so. much like a the mindset of a uh, football coach in junior high like yeah like i had zero interest in sports zero <laughs> And yet the football <laughs> coach came a calling to me one day because I happened to be over six foot and yeah. huge. So yeah. they're like, hey, you want to play some football? And I was like, heck no. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was five foot ten, maybe a buck ten, you know. And so like the sports guys are like, no, not him. <laughs> and he put, he put him like they really were like, no, not not that guy. I, I signed up for track. They're like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> And similarly, one of the times when I went out to visit Jersey in person, yeah. I remember us going to the mall together, and he just pretty much let me walk in front. Yeah. Because I could part the Red Sea of shoppers with that my was fun. hugeness. Well, it was just refreshing to have people get out of my way. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, we go back to the arc. And Teltran 1 has figured out uh, the maximum heat expenditure is at the Arctic Circle. And Jazz is like, well, it could be a natural phenomenon after all. And then Teletran corrects him almost like immediately. <laughs> Teletran has uh, discovered Decepticon activity. And where's Prime during this? He's standing right there, isn't he? He's like right behind, right behind no, Jazz. No, Prime is not standing anywhere. Prime is sitting at a little desk. Adjacent oh, is to, he? <laughs> adjacent to Teletran 1. It's kind of bizarre looking. It's like it's like you'd imagine like a desk in an office, but it's it's robot sized. And he's got his own <laughs> little screen adjacent to Teletran 1. And wow. it seems to me like this is this is the only time we're going to see this little desk of his. It's like it's like if if the Autobots had a receptionist, you can imagine the receptionist bot sitting here. Wow that's true that's something we never made a note of is that 99.99 percent of the time the autobots stand at their computer yeah. they're very much standing desk creatures <laughs> they, they invented the idea yeah yeah and optus is like oh my back <laughs> so much worrying i'm gonna sit down for a little bit and work at this laptop I, yeah, I remember him typing really fast on something, and then it's like heat loss at optimum levels or whatever. But I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't notice that he was sitting. <laughs> so uh, once, once Teletran once like, no, there's Decepticons there. What does Prime say? Well, worried Prime retorts the following: If we don't stop Megatron and his bunch, the Earth is doomed. <laughs> and I love this line. <laughs> If we don't Why? stop Megatron and his bunch, the Earth is doomed. And his bunch, his bunch, that just seems a really weird thing to call an army. Yeah. I mean, the Decepticons are literally an army. His bunch it just <laughs> brings to mind it does, it does lighten the notions tone, like of like a <laughs> wacky gang. Right, like, right. Like if you say like, hey, it's Hitler and his bunch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a phrase anyone would come up to say so right it's like, right it's like you think of like the scooby-doo gang maybe they would be a bunch but uh the decepticons okay whatever <laughs> so a call to action listeners i'm gonna see fan art of the typical brady bunch blue three by three grid only instead of the brady's it's the season one decepticons with megatron right in the middle Megatron and his bunch. Megatron and his bunch. 
That's the way they became Megatron and his bunch. <laughs> I, 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 I'm smelling a uh, 80s tees. Oh, t-shirt. gosh. That, yeah, yeah, that just makes itself. So go to T Public, draw that, yeah. put it up for sale, boom. And then, the and then another t shirt company will steal right from in, as will the <laughs> lawsuits and cease and desist orders. <laughs> so, of course, if he's, if, if, you know, even, even though Optimus is diminishing the threat of the Decepticons by devaluing them from army to bunch, <laughs> they have to go into action. Yeah. It's time to go right? into action. But okay. Jersey. Yes. Jersey. What? Guess what Prime says next. Oh, I know what he says next. <laughs> Autobots, transform and roll out. Yay! 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 He did it! He said the thing! That's the thing we remember him for! <laughs> <laughs> yes, he indeed says, quote, Autobots, transform and roll out. Nothing missing, no, nothing left out of the phrase. It's the full-on phrase. Autobots transform and roll out. <sighs> it only took you seven episodes, man. Well, you know, it, it, it had to gestate. It had to like fully <laughs> form into its truest, <laughs> most perfect, most memorable form. We needed so, an episode of Let's Get Out of Here first. <laughs> <laughs> Jersey is a writer and an artist, and he knows the first draft is not always the strongest. He this is something I say, actually, I, I say this in my classroom all the time, is that I say, you know... Uh, Beyond all of the thousands of choices that comics presents you with, one of the most challenging parts is how to say, have, have a character say, let's go over there as only that character can say it. How can they say it in a way that is iconic, memorable, and reveal something about their personality? So understandably, this is why when Optimus says, let's get out of here, we're like, what? That doesn't sound like Optimus <laughs> Prime. You know, it's like he's big, noble, heroic leader, father figure, right? Let's get out of here. That's something that like Gears would say or uh, Hopper <laughs> would say, let's get out of here, you know, or Mirage would say, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> But see, you you could do that, like when you got really well crafted characters, even if they are as single note as some Transformers characters can be, you can find that little wording that like suggests more to their personality, and it's it's really hard to do. So that's why I'm I tend to be forgiving when it's not done as well as it could be, <laughs> but I get really excited when it's done very well. So they all jump into vehicle mode, and a marvelous Kid Logic moment is coming up as they. We see Spike and Sparkplug in winter clothes. Yeah, they, they left the hard hats at home for this mission. Yeah, they put on uh, floppy-eared uh, winter hats. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Which I, I, I like their outfits. But, and uh, they, they drive off into the sunset, and Spike proclaims, Arctic Circle, here we come. What? 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 Wait, wait a minute. Okay, Arctic Circle, here we come. Yeah. But Jersey, there the, we just deduced that they're in California or Arizona. Uh-huh. And they're going to drive to the Arctic Circle. Yes. Okay. I looked it up and <laughs> now Toronto, which is arguably far from where the Autobots are based, Mm -hmm. Even Toronto, very close to the U.S.-Canada border, is still 1,581 miles from the Arctic Circle. So mm -hmm. presumably the Autobots are much further than that. Yes. And presumably the snowing is much worse than usual, given the conditions on Earth at the time. So no doubt many roads are closed, further delaying <laughs> the commute time. <laughs> And in perfect oh condition, God. this drive will take at least a day, probably two, and that's in regular uh -huh. perfect conditions. And um, these conditions are the opposite of perfect. So I moved, this is going to be a pretty long road trip for the for the bunch. I moved across the country twice, and when I moved from Michigan to Phoenix, Arizona, it took about three days with stops for rest, right? So, yes, it probably took upwards of a week for them to get there. Mm -hmm. Now... 
you talk about the way kids play. You know, it's like this is something that <laughs> I'm thinking like a 10 year old has not like think about when you were 10 and you were stuck in traffic. I remember one holiday season, I was like 12, 11 or 12 years old and a huge snowstorm hit, like a really big one, like while we were like at the mall Christmas shopping, right? Get in the car, we're headed home, the storm hits and it's so bad that we're going maybe 10, 15 miles an hour and it's a an hour drive in good traffic, right? Now, mm-hmm. middle-aged Hoover, middle-aged Jersey, what do we say when this happens? Ugh. You know, this is the worst. You know, how, it's bumper to bumper and nobody knows how to drive when there's weather. And oh, I hate driving. 11 year old Jersey in the back seat's like, this is really pretty. The snow is falling. I got all these cool toys in the car. This doesn't matter to me. The radio's on and Christmas music is playing. I don't know why dad's so grumpy. Why is dad saying all those swear words? Because this is fine. <laughs> So, like, to 11-year-old me, the prospect of a road trip is so abstract, right? Because I have so many things to entertain myself, right? Like, we would drive to New York every, like, once a year to visit my grandparents. It was a 12-hour drive. My dad would be grumpy the whole way. But I'm in the back playing Millbourne with my brother, you know? It's like, who cares? So, like, to a kid, it's like, well, yeah, they're cars. They just drive. (laughs) (laughs) It matches the way kids play. And this is, again, I'm going to point, shine my spotlight on the words kid logic. Does it work in a kid's head? Yep. Then it's good to go. Which is like Dog Man is a pretty popular book. Have you read Dog Man? It's yeah. weird. <laughs> it's like give yourself permission to be weird with this stuff, man. <laughs> and, and like only, again, I'm going to point that kid who works in the TCBY with his hair in his face who thinks everything's lame, you know? It's like... <laughs> He's the one who's like, you know how long that drive would be? Yeah, I know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> They're transforming robots from outer space. <laughs> How'd they get there so fast? That's what I want to know. Well, we don't know because it's a 21-minute cartoon. They fast-forwarded. Megatron's been siphoning energy for a week. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't stand out as, oh, that doesn't make sense. Because, I mean, we don't know how long it took them to get Skyfire out of the ice up there. True. And we don't know how long they were draining things. It's not like there was a clear passage of time on their end and it was unclear on the Autobots' end. It, it isn't discongruous like that. But, right. Uh, it, it just and Sparkplug st- had a Remington microscreen in the car. That's why he comes <laughs> up fully, fully shaved. Yeah, that sounds like something Sparkplug would do. <laughs> And Optimus is like, do you have to do that in here? And he's like, well, I want to look my best, Prime. Ah, I cut myself. Help, help, help. <laughs> no, he, he finishes, he halfway finishes shaving and the battery dies. <laughs> and he doesn't have the car charger. <laughs> or it's incompatible with Optimus's dashboard. And he's like, then he's like, help, help. Screwed out the window. Spark plug, I'm right here. And Hound Hal- runs up, he's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And Optimus is like, don't enable them. <laughs> So anyway, back in the Arctic, (laughs) Megatron and his bunch are joined by Soundwave and Thundercracker, and they're all gathered around a newly melted Skyfire trying to revive him. Yep. Starscream starts giving orders like he's George Clooney on ER, causing Megatron to wonder, Starscream, why do you care? What's going on? Yeah, see, why are you so concerned for this creature? Megatron's even noticing, like, this is unlike you. Right. You are usually the selfish little brat who hates everybody in my organization, especially me. Like, I've never seen you say, like, hey, I want this guy to live, you know? And, like, he's, like, yelling at Soundwave so much that Soundwave turns his arm into a cylinder and then shoots him with electricity. (laughs) But Starscream reveals there's a big revelation here. Why is he so concerned for the creature, Hoover? I knew him once, a long time ago, back on Cybertron. And Megatron almost sounds like a suspicious boyfriend here. You knew him? (laughs) That's a weird thing to read into. (laughs) You knew him? It just reminds me of like, let's say you're dating this girl for a while. And it's like she just happens to mention some guy from her past. It's like, oh, really? You knew that guy, (laughs) huh? What's up with that? (laughs) It just seems like it just seems like Megatron's digging for more information. It sounds you awfully accusatory. Him? I mean, obviously Starstream's gonna know people, but 
But his delivery yeah. is, you knew him? <laughs> yeah. It, wait, wait, wait a minute. You were friends with somebody? Somebody <laughs> liked you? You think that's somebody what it is? <laughs> it's, it's like <laughs> people actually talk to you and you knew other <laughs> beings. They could stand to be around you. <laughs> I thought I was the first. I thought that's why you were a Decepticon, because I was the first person who bothered to talk to you. <laughs> I guess I'm not special. Uh, but, okay, so this, I feel like, is an important thing. And this is something that th- we promise with this show, is, like, obsessive and borderline shameful levels of analysis mm-hmm. of these characters. But Sunbow is only gives us just enough to imagine. There's a lot of different writers in the organization. We're all doing different things with the character. The performers are doing different performances with the character. So we get sometimes contradictory or uh, seemingly contradictory information, and we got to piece it together as watchers and viewers of the show and as fans Mm. of the show, right? So this is the part that makes me go like, holy cow, this is new. Starscream had a friend or at least a colleague. Mm -hmm. Now... Put that in perspective. Up to this point, he has been utterly alone as a, as a Decepticon. He, st- he stands alone. He's he is the, he doesn't agree with any of his collaborators. Right, all the fellow soldiers like Megatron's the best. He's like, oh, I can't stand Megatron, and, right. and he kind of doesn't like anybody else either. Like <laughs> you never see him hanging out with Thundercracker and Reflector on break, right? Mm-mm. Like Starscream, if, if if he shows up when Rumble and Skyfire are in the cave, he's like, "What are you doing? Why are you standing around? Get to work!" You know, in the Ruby Mines of Burma, he's like, "Hurry up, get this car loaded faster!" You know, <laughs> he he's not he's not friends with anybody that he works with. Now we find out that at one point he had a colleague, and he's expressing genuine excitement. He might not be alone anymore. He might have a cohort in this organization and we see for the first time and probably i would say the only time that you know starscream has some regular people feelings inside of there and it gets my fan and wondering like what would have happened if skyfire stayed on the decepticons Mm -hmm. and maybe uncomfortably maybe he doesn't like being there but he's like but my loyalty is to my friend and i'm gonna keep i'm gonna stand by my friend what would that have done to starscream it is an interesting question to consider. But at the very least, we get this idea that, okay, Starscream is not entirely psychotic, right? He is not a pure sociopath. Mm-hmm. So they haven't quite woken Skyfire up yet, but like this, his head opens up, right? And there's, what, what, is, what does Starscream say? Like, his name is Skyfire. Observe our history as it was recorded before his icy imprisonment. I think that's the line. Well, they uncovered this little uh, TV screen inside Skyfire. So this is a convenient way for his last moments before crashing onto Earth to be relayed to the gang. Yeah. The the bunch, I should say. <laughs> that's what we're going to call from now on. <laughs> yep. Megatron and his bunch. <laughs> Come on, bunch. Retreat, bunch. <laughs> so yeah we see you know i think in like a more modern cartoon they would have done something where they like connect wires into his head and then project it onto a monitor outside Mm. of his body but like yeah something like that but for the point of clarity and just ease of understanding there's like look he's got a monitor in his brain and we just turned it on and it's i don't interpret this as being literal i interpret this as being like more of like visual poetry where in some very convenient way they watch because who what kid wants to sit through starscream telling the story just looking at starscream as cool as starscream is <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like like you ever tell try to tell a story to a kid with them just looking at you it's it's pretty tough but like if you show them the story it's like here's i got pictures or i've got cartoons visual visual learning modality everybody anyway he and Sky, uh, Skyfire were explorers from Cybertron, and it shows them transform and fly off into outer space. Megatron remarks, this must have been before our final falling out with the Autobots. And I also like that he describes it as a falling out. Mm-hmm. Like, I just imagine this sort of begrudging unity <laughs> for a while. But, yeah. but then it's like, one day he's just... Prime, we're really not making this work, are we? I guess I guess we have to go our separate ways. <laughs> the John Hughes music plays. Yeah. That's what I uh, think of when I think of the phrase falling out. 
Yeah, let's agree to disagree. Um, and in reality, it probably involved a lot more shooting. If this I don't show really has think a, of fallings <laughs> out, including shooting. <laughs> yeah, this this whole episode is just full of like softer language to describe things. Right, Megatron <laughs> and his bunch, yes. and then Civil War. You know, the American Civil War was just a falling out we had with the, the falling States. out. Yeah. <laughs> the Confederacy. <laughs> we didn't see eye to eye. Eh, you know, mistakes were made. So they they they're exploring a planet which was they didn't know it at the time, but it was Earth, and a windstorm separates them. Oh, and actually, Starscream says like. I don't detect any intelligent life, so let's just go home. But Skyfire's like, ah, let's look closer. Windstorm happens, and then we see through Skyfire's eyes as he's going towards the ice and all of a sudden crash. And this is another line. This is important. Starscream says, I circled half the globe searching for him, but he was gone. And you can hear the sadness, right? Mm-hmm. It's a very different delivery by Chris Lotta here for Starscream. Yeah. It sounds like, like almost wistful. Like, it's not at all like... He's not like, I searched half the planet. He's like, I searched half the planet, you know. It's yeah. Mournful almost. It is the yeah, most emotion yeah. we get out of Starscream. It, I mean, well, most emotion that's not uh, all-consuming, <laughs> screeching greed. Right. Right? Yeah. yeah, so like this, I feel like this is, if, if anybody's a Starscream fan, this should be their favorite episode, right? Because like this is the one where we get the most nuance with the character, and as what we're going to explore coming up is we also find out like what his uh, what the, this particular writer thought was the crucial weakness in Starscream's internal logic. But we'll get to that. So Skyfire wakes up, and we hear that voice. Uh, and who is it? It's Greg Berger. At this point in the series. We are not familiar with his voice. So this is a yeah, new a voice new... for us. He is. And let's see, Greg Berger, what characters did he play on G.I. Joe before this point? He played uh, Cutter, the pilot of the mm. of the, shark, of the the whale. <laughs> Keep away from the reef! <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> Cutter, who had poor hearing, had shouted at everybody. Instead of fighting when you disagree, look for a better way. He played Spirit. Blind does not mean you cannot see how to solve problems. Um, ah. He played Firefly. To know my identity is to ensure your doom. So, oh, that's right. He was beginning to be a, a pretty major player at Sunbow, but this was his first Transformers appearance. And I love his performance as Skyfire in this first episode. Oh, because... His voice is just gravelly enough to suggest that, okay, just like the other Autobots, like Hound, Huffer, Windcharger, he's an adult, He's a, he, but he's got just enough like softness to it that suggests mm-hmm. a little younger than them, which, again, I don't think anybody was actually, well, may, maybe, maybe Wally Burr was thinking about this, but to me, in retrospect, it's like, it's suggesting this character has room to grow. Right, Hound, Wind Charger, those guys are fully formed. They're not going to grow much more than they have. And as we explored last episode, you know, the humans are the ones that help them grow. Right? Mm-hmm. Skyfire is showing up, not quite baked, and I love that about this character. The promise of he's he's got something to learn in this episode, but what he has to learn is to listen to himself. Ah, oh, oh my gosh! Anyway. <laughs> The more you know. Oh, I'm such a sucker for this stuff. <laughs> I really am. Michael T. Fox comes on the screen and tells me not to do drugs. I'm like, I won't. <laughs> the Starscream tells Skyfire that he's on Earth, and then yeah. Megatron steps up and introduces himself. <laughs> I am Megatron Skyfire, supreme leader of all Decepticons. We are on this planet to collect the energy we need to revive Cybertron and conquer the universe. And the Autobots are now our enemies. So, yeah, he's like, the Autobots are now our enemies. So, I mean, apparently, you, I think you're right. Like, when he said there's a final falling out, like, there were Decepticons and Autobots, but maybe they had some kind of uneasy alliance before they finally went to war, huh? Mm-hmm. If we were to believe all the flashbacks in Season 3, I mean, uh, the Decepticons were the war machines and the Autobots were sort of the... Consumer goods, I think that's what they called them? Yeah, something like that. They were the Roombas. And whatnot. Yeah, they they were the series and the Roombas. 
That, that's that's <laughs> that, that's our modern equivalent. Roomba Miss Prime, clean this living room. Which means if you have a Roomba, you're no better than a Quintesson. Think about that. I'm kidding. All right, so we cut to the Autobots now. Yep, the Autobots are pulling up to the Arctic Circle, so it's been a long, fun road trip, but they're they're pretty much here now, and they're enjoying the Aurora Borealis as they drive. Again, Spike with his earnestness that just, just warms my heart. He's like, oh, look at the Northern Lights. Aren't they terrific? Like, when was the last time you said that about anything? Like, when was the last time you pointed at something? Like, Isn't that terrific? <laughs> Probably when I was watching this cartoon. <laughs> And I mean for isn't the first time ever. <laughs> Boy, isn't this Transformers cartoon terrific? <laughs> it's really incredible. Okay, so Optimus is like, yeah, it's very nice. I like the Northern Lights, but forward Autobots. And then we cut back to Megatron and his bunch. And, we'll... <laughs> and how do you get inducted into the Megatron bunch? <laughs> well, he has to hand pick you. And then yeah. there's there's probably this giant machine called a Robo Smasher that he has to use for a final indoctrination, but uh, uh-huh. we'll get to that later on. <laughs> so Megatron is inducting Skyfire into the Decepticons with his very own Decepticon logo decal, mm. and he immediately puts Skyfire on guard duty. Now, <laughs> do you think Megatron just like keeps? Like five Decepticon decals in his back pocket, like for these kind of situations where he runs into <laughs> giant robots that he thinks would be good for his team. He bought a or, third party sticker sheet that he keeps. <laughs> <laughs> he went to toyhacks.com. In case I find any large robots that I want to recruit. <laughs> what about me? You're too small. <laughs> Oh, because like that symbol would have would have been like the size of Rumble's chest, right? Like, right. Like, yeah. You're you're just something called now Rumble. I can't move in this thing. <laughs> 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 but yeah, that's weird. Like they just have. I mean, and there's another funny part coming up where Skyfire has a sticker of his own. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it is weird that he's just like, all right, well, we'll put a sticker. They can make their hands turn into like fire extinguishers. Maybe that one of them has like a hand that turns into a paintbrush, right? <laughs> well, if Soundwave can basically p- print up energon cubes out of his chest, I I don't see why a sticker would be any problem, really. Yeah, yeah. Soundwave has a secret third mode, which is a printer. <laughs> or maybe w- there's a reflector robot that's a printer, and oh. <laughs> he's he's always at Megatron's side when he needs. Okay, I need some Decepticon logos. Transform. HP, transform. <laughs> Happy printer is what it stands for. He's like, I'm glad to do it for you, Megatron. You're number one. <laughs> I love how all the all the background Decepticon characters that you have to assign personalities to are always super happy and best friends and all that. <laughs> if that if that isn't telling, I don't know what is. Oh, they're funny characters. So He's on guard patrol, and then Skyfire turns to Starscream. Okay, this is this is another important scene. But what what happens here? He's like Starscream. Are you happy being a warrior instead of a scientist? Starscream's retort is yes. It's much more exciting. I'm just imagining a young Starscream. Like, hmm, what should I do with my life? Well, I guess if I were a scientist, that would be kind of exciting. <laughs> Dad yeah, says okay, I should. <laughs> <laughs> and then he finds out about this thing called war and whoa that's way more exciting <laughs> why did anybody tell me <laughs> that blowing things up oh, and and murdering wow but then what does he say he's like oh this is much more exciting and besides i'm gonna be leader someday and then you can be my second in command so he's already got the nepotism planned out for when he takes control of the Decepticons. <laughs> He's just so darn Which, happy to have somebody on his side. Yeah, right? I mean, like, that's that's part of it. It's like, and this is also, think about, okay, I'll, I'll go into this more, like, like, this is reminding me of, like, childhood relationships in a lot of ways. But he's actually offering to share power, right? This is so unlike him. He's like, you could be my second in command. I'm going to let you co-run things with me, right? It's not just Starscream and then everybody else. He's going to have a second in command. It's going to be Skyfire. That shows that there's trust and there's some kind of affection at work there that we've never seen this character before. And again, like the fact that his 
tone of voice even change where he's like, are you happier with this way? He's like, he doesn't say, yeah, I get to shoot people. You know, he's like, yes, it's far more exciting. You know, he's like, he seems like genuinely cheerful, right? Mm. He's not trying to sell Sky- Skyfire on, you know, like the warlord aspect. He's just like, this is fun. But another thing I love about the scene is Skyfire responds, I'm grateful to you. This is important. You got to pay attention to the dialogue here. I am grateful to you for freeing me from my tomb of ice. I shall try to bring you credit. Sunbow is so good. The writers of Sunbow were so good at just giving us enough to understand the motivation of the character without saying what their motivation is. I shall try to bring you credit. You would not say that if you understood that your partner was going to stage a coup. What Starscream's saying in this scene is someday I'll be in charge because I'm going to murder Megatron. Skyfire doesn't understand that. He says... I'll, dr- I'll try to bring you credit so when that promotion comes around <laughs> mm-hmm. and Megatron makes you the leader, right? Right. <laughs> he wouldn't say, I shall try to bring you credit under any other context. Who knows if it's landing on the kid's head or not. But if you're listening carefully, you understand that without him actually saying it, I don't understand that you guys are bad yet. And I still think that we're actually friends and I'm trusting you. Because I'm grateful to you, you saved my life, and also because our past history has given me no indication as to why I shouldn't trust you. So Yes. Now, I would dispute, well, dispute is too strong a word, but you're coming at this looking at them as friends, and Starscream finally finding a friend. But to me, it feels like Starscream is glad to have a big guy on his side to me it's all about power for him Mm. i think they work together a lot i think they were certainly close co-workers i think he actually spent time looking for him when he crashed but i don't think starscream ever thought of him as you know my buddy i think he probably saw him as something he could use who knows, maybe he was stealing his scientific inventions and claiming he made them. <laughs> I just feel like Starscream is entirely too selfish to be coming at this from, oh, this is my friend and my pal. No, I think Starscream is just so happy that he finally has some big, strong dude who he who thinks will him. clearly be on his side. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's overwhelming him here. I don't think it's based out of, oh, my great friend who I missed so much. It doesn't so, feel right to me. What's cool about that is that either interpretation, the scene still works, right? Right. Because the, exactly. the main thing about the scene is that Starscream has one motivation, Skyfire doesn't understand it, and Skyfire has another motivation, and they both said the truth to one another. They both spoke mm-hmm. the truth, but the subtext of what they're saying is very different. And right. that is that is always fun in, in a scene with characters. So it's a very short scene. It's it's almost forgettable. But having watched the show a whole bunch of times, we have time to like sit and dwell and chew on these lines. <laughs> but but also it's like that's why we're doing this this show is to celebrate the moments where it's like they were hitting it on all cylinders in that particular scene. This is not mm-hmm. this is a good cartoon episode, I, mm-hmm. I would argue. Yeah. Yes, I would agree. This is a very well written episode. As Starscream walks away, Skyfire's like, well, it's time to do my job. And he goes out on guard duty, and he sees something. Something's approaching from the south. Several unusual vehicles. Earth mechanisms, perhaps. It seems the time has come for me to make the change from science to war. So he is not thrilled about this. He's committed, but he's not... You, you can hear it in his voice that he's not happy about what he's about to do. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, there's like something that's really grim in his voice. And this, this connected with me as a child. I remember watching this, because like this is also around the time when I was... like So like here, bringing my own personal context to this, I was a, a smaller kid when I was in elementary school. Uh, I, was, I was built kind of lean, and I was... I wouldn't say that I was shy, but I was sensitive, and I was I was a fearful kid, right? And there were, there were lots of bigger kids. I was in a rural town. You've been there. You've been to my hometown, Hoover. Mm-hmm. You can attest it's a tiny, tiny place. And in these small rural farming communities, like it, it, especially in the early '80s, what was celebrated was strength, toughness, being on the football team, being manly in the old 1950s sense of the word. Mm-hmm. 
And so, like, bullying, like, people looked the other way on the playground when, like, rough stuff was happening. And I remember it frightened me a lot that, like, when I went on the playground, you, you could get hurt by some kid, you know? And so whenever I saw a character in these cartoons express any reluctance to fight, I was like, okay, so it's okay that I don't like to do this? It's like, I didn't get much guidance from growing ups that, of otherwise. The other girls were like, well, you fight back. That's what men do. And I'm like, but <laughs> it's really scary, and I don't like the way it feels when I hit a person. <laughs> like, well, that's just what you do, man up. And I'm like, well, this guy, this, this cartoon character is letting me know that it's not a joyful activity, right? Skyfire's not like, well, I guess I'm a warrior now. Time to shoot some people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, so that's another instance where I connected with this character a lot. So so the Autobots stop, they transform, and... Yep, Prime says, Autobots transform, so he's basically tipped Skyfire into revealing that, uh, that hey, these are those Autobots that Megatron was talking about. Megatron said they're our enemy, so... Mm-hmm. Skyfire proclaims they must be destroyed! Commercial break. I remember this scene. I remember watching this on Saturday morning, and I remember... It frightened me. Like, I remember thinking, like, oh, no. Now, compare this to the cliffhanger in, like, part two of the first miniseries when Optimus is rolling down the hill after getting blown up and Bumblebee mm-hmm. and the Sparkler are blown up. I'm like, why would this one be more intense? Because it's just Skyfire pointing the gun at the screen saying, you must be destroyed. But I remember thinking, like, oh, they're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is a very big robot. He is the biggest robot we've seen so far. So... While Burger King is twisting his ring and making magical things happen, I'm going, but what about Optimus? <laughs> New Jersey, why don't you try this cinnamon toast crunch? And, and I don't care about Charmkins. Don't talk to me about Charmkins. I want to know Jersey, what's they love about hanging Charmkins. around. <laughs> oh, so, so what happens? Well, Skyfire, being a scientist, does not know how to gun good, and he doesn't manage to hit any of the Autobots that are right in front of him. Though the shots do send Spike and Sparkplug running for cover. Mm -hmm. Spike runs a little too far, right into an icy lake. Oh, and does Spike say, I got this, don't worry about me, Dad. (laughs) Yeah, where's the Spike that last episode was grabbing Jazz's gun and ready to take on the Decepticons? That's not this Spike. He's uh, found his way into some icy cold water, and his retort is... Well, falling into ice water is a pretty scary proposition because if there's a current, it's going to suck you under the ice and then you're done. So I'm with Spike on this one. He he wins some sympathy points with me. <laughs> I'd probably be screaming help too, especially because I can't swim that good. So Sparkplug, being a good dad, even though he's only half shaved, pulls Spike out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> he manages to pull Spike from the water, so he f- frees him from, from the ice water, but... Now the ice that they're sitting on is cracking, and it's basically stranding them on like a small little island of ice away from the the rest of the ground. And to which they say, we'll figure this out, right? (laughs) They say, let's workshop this. Now, let's see. Maybe we could build a bridge out of our little furry hats. No. Instead, we get this. And I think this counts as a separate time because the first help he was calling for was help get me out of the water. And now it's like, help get us off this ice boat we're trapped on, essentially. I see. They're asking for two discrete uh, aids. These are two separate instances of requiring assistance. (laughs) Got it. So series wide, we are at five helps. (laughs) <laughs> but the Autobots are pinned down by Skyfire's wild shots, so no one can uh, get away to help these humans. Yeah. So hearing all this loud commotion, Skyfire deduces that this, this must be the Earth creatures making this sound. Strange voices. Can I say something quick about the voices in this? Up until this point, we really never had a cartoon where all the principal characters had some kind of vocal effect going on with their voices, right? Mm. And, and this is another thing that, like, as a kid... 
it, I don't know why, but it excited me. It excited me that every main character had some kind of vocal effect going on to make them sound more mechanical. So that when Skyfire says, strange voices must be coming from Earth creatures, it doesn't seem weird that he says that. Because everybody else mm. in this world all talks with that weird little, I don't know, like echo or like a, like a static, not static sound, but like some kind of like, it sounds like there's a vibrational thing going on in their voice. Spike doesn't have that. So when he says, strange mm. voices, I must try to communicate with them. Okay. I'm going to make this case, and I'm going to make it a couple more times in this episode. Skyfire is a character who acts out of a strong internal principle. I have been instructed by my friends, the Decepticons, mm -hmm. my good friend Starscream who saved my life, to defend against the Autobots. Okay, I guess I'm going to do it. I'm going to shoot at these guys. Wait a second. I hear something that, that intrigues my scientific function. I'm going to drop everything and go over there. But mm -hmm. what about Starscream, your friend? Yeah, I know, but... I'm a scientist, and that's my primary function. That's my primary operating principle, and I'm going to react to that, right? Mm -hmm. Would that we all had a primary function stamped on a card for us so we knew how to make decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes over to them. Yeah, he, he picks up the humans, and uh, here we go again. <laughs> Okay, and this also has to count as a separate help because this is no longer help. I'm trapped in freezing water. Help, I'm trapped on a ice thing that's floating away from the rest of the land. This is help. There's a giant Decepticon who has grabbed us. <laughs> yep. So now we're up to six instances of calling for help in seven episodes. And Skyfire says, why are you so frightened? I won't harm you. And then like, does the, this nice close-up of the Decepticon symbol on his <laughs> chest just go, this is what Spike's looking at, kids. And then Spike says, you know, well, why are you wearing the Decepticon symbol if you won't hurt us? Only the evil Autobots need fear me. Mm -hmm. And Spike is bark poop like, uh, you got it a little mixed up. You Decepticons are the real monsters. <laughs> and Skyfire says what to that? And he says, no, I'll take you to Megatron and you'll see. This is another scene that has like a lot of cool subtext to it where he says he'll show you you have nothing to fear mm -hmm. like, he, he really means it he's being he's like no I, I'm, I'm gentle and i'm kind i'm being really, that's even scarier <laughs> because <laughs> they know that megatron's is gonna kill him but he's like no you have nothing to fear it's gonna be okay like it's like the whole like shh, 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 right shh. you know how, like that drives you crazy when somebody does that it's <laughs> like he's doing that but he doesn't even know he's doing it because he thinks he's being kind <laughs> So big old Skyfire just walks away with these humans and the Autobots can't risk a shot because what are they going to have cliff jumper shoot at him? Nope. <laughs> that would have been a funny scene. I'll get him. Yeah. Cliff jumper. We know what happens when you do that. <laughs> yeah. Optimus turns him and does. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so they just got to let him go. Yeah. Got to find a safer way. So. So let me get this crazy shot. Where Skyfire yeah. is peering into a cave, and the cave is the size of Skyfire's head only. And yeah. yet, Megatron and Starscream are in the cave. So, basically, <laughs> suddenly, Skyfire is a good... He was about twice Megatron's height, at best. But now he's clearly like now he's Omega ten Supreme. times his height. So, I don't know where they got this idea. So, this is just yeah, this is a weird shot. drawn badly. <laughs> but anyway... Basically, Skyfire just passes the humans into Megatron and Starscream, and Starscream imprisons the humans in a little ice jail. And Skyfire says he promised the Earth creatures that no harm would come to them. So here we get to my thesis statement on this episode. This is the story of when you start hanging out with cool kids who rub you the wrong way, right? Like when you're a kid and you're figuring out who you are and what the difference between right and wrong is, you start mixing with a lot of different crowds, right? And the problem of this story is set up when Skyfire trusts his old friend who's taken up with a bad crowd. And, you know, and, and the conflict of this story keeps coming from this is character driven conflict. The conflict is that Skyfire, Skyfire has strong internal principles. When was the last time you had the presence of mind and the internal courage to look somebody in the eye and say, no, nope, this is wrong. Mm. I don't like what's happening here, right? That's tough. That is super tough to say in our very delicate, nuanced society to look somebody in the eye and say, this is wrong. You know, and I remember as a little kid, I practiced this. I literally practiced this. Like when I went to camp and they wanted me to shoot rifles, I'm like, I don't know if I feel okay about this, <laughs> you know? And, and, and like I looked an adult in the eye and said, I don't, I don't like this. I don't want to do this, you know? 
what a marvelous thing for young people to see on a screen in this scene right here. He's like, I promised them. I said that this wouldn't happen. Therefore, I'm holding myself accountable. So I have to look you in the eye and say, this is wrong. But then Megatron says... <laughs> Megatron says, then you overstepped your authority. And Starscream says that once the humans are no longer useful, they're going to be terminated. And this bums Skyfire out. And my function is to further science and learning, not to destroy innocent life forms. So it's like, it's one of those things where it's like the, the fact that the file card says this is their primary function. This is the central principle that these characters operate out of, right? Ah. Uh, I already said my piece on this, and I just love it. Well, meanwhile, the Autobots are trying to find Spike and Sparkplug, and half the team manages to fall through the ice as they get separated <laughs> from the other half. Yeah, it's like Gear suddenly like just stops at the entrance. Like Optimus and like uh, Bumblebee and Cliffjumper and Jazz go in, mm -hmm. and then Gears like stops at the door. Like, what's wrong, Gears? And like they just like fall through the ice. Yeah. So. I think it's Gears, Hound, Ironhide, and... Ratchet. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so we cut to Prime's team, and Prime's driving around without his trailer, but then it returns for one scene, and then it disappears again. So I'm guessing <laughs> they intentionally showed him without the trailer because they're driving through narrow caves, and it's not something you'd assume a semi could really drive through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's that weird scene where Cliffjumper like takes off and Optimus is like Cliffjumper be cautious and he backs up into a tunnel and like his trailer hooks up with him and then he drives forward with the trailer <laughs> it's that that's it's an odd bit of business there I don't understand what they were really doing but okay uh, I guess because he he does use his trailer later in this episode mm -hmm. but as they're driving around what do they hear Hoover they hear something ah uh, the siren call of the humans <laughs> in this episode at least <laughs> so uh how come we didn't hear cyclonus counting this one well, down cyclonus can only count to six and we're at uh, seven Aww. instances of yelling for help now i Great. really didn't Thanks, think we Spike. were going to hit that by episode seven but we have <laughs> wow so cliff jumper <laughs> what does he do well cliff jumper follows the awful sound he's hearing to the makeshift jail and freezed the humans. And this leaves Optimus's half of the team to find Ironhide. But that team has stumbled upon Megatron, who conveniently monologues his plan right in front of them. If you ever want to know what Megatron's plan is, just listen to the wall of the room he's standing yes. in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Megatron sees them <sighs> peeking over the snow, and the Seekers get the jump on them. Yep. Dispose of them immediately. Mm -hmm. And Starscream's like, with pleasure, he takes them away. But Megatron's not done yet. Soundwave launches Ravage to locate any other Autobots. And when we see them, Jazz is saying they've searched the tunnels for Astro Minutes looking for Ironhide and the gang. Oh boy. So not only are there Astro Seconds, but there's Astro Minutes. So we were just talking about like, oh, okay, astroseconds are useful because they're very robotic creatures and they measure time faster than we do. But now there's astro minutes, so that kind of blows a hole in the whole theory of... There's 75 trillion astroseconds in an astro minute, right? <laughs> so, something like that. I, I, I just like the fact that Jazz says it like, astro minutes, like, man, forever. Mm -hmm. Like, astro minutes means forever. So, like, that's... I'm guessing an Astro Minute is some improbably huge amount of time, like nine hours, right? <laughs> nine hours is an Astro Minute. An Astro Second is like a trillionth of a second. There's no uh, decimeters and millimeters in between the, the measurements. They're just like super tiny and impossibly big. <laughs> and it's become very clear that this isn't any sort of mathematical thing that was in the Transformer <laughs> Bible that writers refer to. They pretty much just made it up. Right? There's no conversion <laughs> like, chart to like... By the way, <laughs> astroseconds equal this many seconds. Can I just say, this is a thing that I find delightful about this that I wish we had more of in fiction. Cause like, I feel like nowadays there's such a pressure on all of us. I mean, I'm speaking now as a cartoonist to like, you got to work out how your system of magic works. You got to mm. work out how your the internal logic of your world and how its physics work. I'm like, or we can make it up as we go along and just suggest world because we don't have to know. Like, it's like the whole idea of like, um, you know, wanting to know, like, what is the social structure of Jawas? Like, I don't care. Just give me <laughs> cute Jawas who talk weird and have, like, a bizarre giant castle tank that they drive around and they steal stuff. 
You know, I, I don't need to know. I don't need a book about that. <laughs> I don't need to have everything explained to me. Just do enough to excite my imagination. Uh, and I feel like that this is one of those things where it's like, yeah, they, they're just like, you could tell they're playing it by ear mm-hmm. and it's fun. <laughs> Astro Minutes. <laughs> Well, Cliff Jumper's been bored for Astro Minute, so he's impatient, and he <laughs> runs ahead, hoping to find Ironhide, but instead he finds Ravage, who pounces directly onto him. But it isn't long before, of all characters, Bumblebee shoots the roof of the tunnel, and snow buries Ravage, allowing the Autobots to get away. And there's another snow pun here. Uh, That's what I call stopping him cold. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Oh... <laughs> Oh, everybody come over to my house for Christmas, not Hoover's, because we're going to we're going to relish in snow puns together. <laughs> <laughs> so Ironhide, Gears, Ratchet and Hound are all held at Null Ray Point by Starscream and Skyfire. And Starscream orders mm-hmm. Skyfire to terminate the Autobots, but he won't. He says he's a scientist, not an executioner. And these guys haven't okay. done anything wrong. He hasn't seen them do anything wrong. Again, internal principle. Maybe Starscream's right. Starscream could very well have, you know, like this is what makes making decisions so hard is like, okay, this is my friend who saved my life. And I have a history with this guy. I have reason to trust him, right? But he's been doing some weird stuff that makes me uncomfortable. And so therefore, I'm going to withhold judgment now. And I'm just going to, what do I have to, to help me make decisions? I've got a strong internal principle. I'm a scientist. I work by observation. I, I come up with um, hypotheses. I test the hypotheses. And then I, I form a theory, right? I haven't seen these people do anything wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So therefore, I refuse to do what you tell me until I have more information. Right. It seems like a simple this almost seems like a parable. Right. It's like a simple Bible story or something. Mm -hmm. Um, He but he chose not to do wrong. You know, but think about what's at work here for the character. He has to navigate all of these emotions that are probably happening in his head of gratitude. And am I being a jerk because I'm not being less grateful to this guy who saved my life as I'm defying him. But I have this internal principle that I have to operate under and I didn't see them do anything wrong. Therefore, I can't do what you're asking me to do. Now let's go to Starscream. Starscream is the character who is always a traitor. He's always defying Megatron. He's always trying to usurp control. So if he was an honest character, if he was honest with himself... The fact that Skyfire betrays him, he'd be like, well, you know, that's what you do. That's what I do. I would do the same thing. I betray people all the time. I'm Starscream. Here's my card. It says traitor on it, you know? (laughs) But he's infuriated. He says, they have done no wrong. He says, but you have, traitor. And he shoots him Mm -hmm. in the chest, right? Why would that make Starscream so angry? Because Starscream is lying to himself, right? He's lying to himself that he thinks that what he is doing is right. And to have somebody actually have an internal principle is infuriating to him. Hmm. So that's my read on the scene. Well, to me, it just sort of reinforces my take that he's not friends with Skyfire. He viewed Skyfire yeah. as someone who could be on his side. And now when he's clearly not just doing everything Starscream says, Starscream is pissed because he was looking forward to having this big guy on his side and now he's proven that he's not just going to blindly do whatever Starscream says and this angers him. If they were more of a friend sort of relationship, I don't think Starscream would get so mad here. He would try to reason Mm. with him. You know, if, Mm. if there was that sort of basis of a friendship he would try to maybe win Skyfire over to his side. But instead, Starscream's just mad. He's just yeah. ticked off to the point of he shoots Skyfire right in the chest. Yeah. And then the Autobots are horrified. You know, like, oh, how could you do that? You piece of garbage. And Starscream turns to them and says, I will enjoy this. This is pretty violent. Mm-hmm. I, I got to say, this, this is a pretty violent scene to have the villain turn to the heroes, point blank range. They're unarmed. He's got a gun. He, and, and before he murders them, he says, I'm going to love doing what I'm about to do. <laughs> 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 what a P.O.S. Oh, my gosh. Starscream, you're the worst. <laughs> so he shoots the Autobots. And now it's time for a commercial. When you buy a McDonald's Happy Meal, you get one of four different Lego building sets. I don't care about Happy Meals. I just saw a bunch of dead Autobots on the screen. Okay, how about Apple Jacks? Do these Apple Jacks, do they look yummy? Do you want to tell your dad to eat what you like? 
they don't even make sense. They, they're not apples and they're not jacks. What does that even mean? Well, what about uh, the G.I. Joe Mobat? You can still buy that at your local store. You want to you wanna get one of those and forget about these lame Transformers? My dad doesn't like me to get any toys that require batteries, so no. <laughs> and besides, there's dead Transformers over there. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That bit's not going to get old, is it? <laughs> so we're back from commercial, and we see... What do we see? We see smoking Autobot carcasses. <laughs> and then Starscream's, like, delighted. <laughs> He's laughing at what just happened. Oh, my gosh. He really is the worst. And then he turns to his friend, who has a smoking chest wound... And he's like, well, so much for you. And he walks over top of him. Walks off, leaves these smoking Autobots and, and Skyfire alone. And then we see the Autobots aren't in pieces at all. We learn they're alive. And it was just one of Hound's handy holograms. Yeah. And Skyfire says, oh, thank goodness you're functional. And they say... Well, we hope we can do the same thing for you. And let's drag him, be, find some cover, and start working. And thank goodness Ratchet was there. Yeah. Uh, so they repair Skyfire as best as they can. But who's watching Laserbeak? And he witnesses all this yeah. with his new little head camera, which is upgraded since last episode. So Laserbeak ra- radios Megatron through a series of beeps. Mm-hmm. And we cut to Megatron. This is a, this is a neat shot. Yeah, it's a very casual Megatron just sitting down on the ground, and he's twirling an Energon cube in his hand. Yeah, he's just like bored, passing the time. Notice that these are also we're still looking at the multicolored cubes. These are not the purple cubes yet. Mm-hmm. So that I, I'm I'm going to pay attention for when that switch occurs. But at, at this point, still the uh, Energon cubes are like rainbow sort of collage colored. It looks like you're looking through a, a fuzzy kaleidoscope as mm-hmm. you look at the inside of the cube. So these beeps set something off in Megatron's chest. And apparently what these beeps mean is that Laserbeak found the Autobots. And by the way, they're not dead. So being communicated this by Laserbeak, Megatron just throws the Energon Cube at Starscream's head. And (laughs) And the best part is like... It hits him in the head, and Starscream is like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Like, it's not not all all that shocking. Yeah, it's like, oh, Megatron threw something else at me. Why are you doing that now? It's like, now why are you throwing something at me? It's like, you failed. The Autobots are still alive. And it doesn't take Starscream. He doesn't, he doesn't just say, you failed. He says, you disgust me. <laughs> what a terrible boss. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You disgust me because you failed. Man, do not make a mistake in the Decepticons. <laughs> and Starscream realizes, oh, it was Hound's holograms. So here we have another yeah. instance of Decepticons actually knowing Autobots by name, which we both like. Yep. Actually knows who Hound is and that he's the annoying one who can do these hologram things. Yep. So then, like, Megatron says, well, Decepticons, go get them. And who <laughs> and who the goes three to seekers get them? fly off to attack the non-dead Autobots. And Prime is here. Prime actually uses his trailer and either a very mm-hmm. off-model roller or another component inside his trailer comes out and fires at Skywarp, well, causing Skywarp to crash directly into Thundercracker and the pair just fall to Earth. Yeah, that part, that part is pretty cute because, like, when he when he starts to lose control and bumps into Thundercracker, you just hear Thundercracker very weakly go, "No!" <laughs> <laughs> it's like this is your one line, John Stevens, and here you go, "No." <laughs> uh, but that that thing that comes out of the trailer was part of the toy. It just it, it looks very similar before. anyway. It's it's yeah. pretty darn off model, but it looks like the little yeah. blue part in the back that has the guns on it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, now we're about to approach imaginative fight scenes again, which last episode, not so good. Like, what did we get? We got Optimus with eye like, beams and that scene when he's shooting Megatron on the ground while Megatron, like, wriggles like a baby. <laughs> but this this scene, like, I know the animation, like, doesn't quite live up to what the promise mm-hmm. is. But, but if you think about it I, as a storyboard, like, they really thought it out. 
They did. They did. And like what I love about this fight scene is like it's celebrating the fact that, hey, guess what? They're robots. They can do crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so this 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 fight scene really st- stands out for me as like one of the like I don't know why the masterpiece toys don't come with giant crystal swords. So what happens? So Megatron joins the battle and he faces off against Prime as he always does, and the pair mm-hmm. arm themselves with this weird green crystal stuff that we've seen in the background of this episode that never really got explained. But they break yeah. off basically like a sword kind of shape of it so they could Mm -hmm. use them as swords and battling each other and there's very interesting choreography i would say uh yeah like optimus and megatron lock arms and megatron pushes himself up into the air so he's like sort of hovering above prime with his arms still locked with prime and then his waist flips around so when he lands his hips are facing optimus but his face is facing away and then he swings his body around to hit optimus with his sword Mm -hmm. right like stuff like that happens yeah which is great in theory and and on the storyboard, but it, you can tell like the animators they make it happen, but it loses something in the translation. It's like the difference between someone performing a song and and really making the song their own. Yeah. So uh, Optimus, you know, spins his fist around as Megatron jumps at him. Megatron fly gets deflected away, lands on the ground, looks at his sword. His sword is busted off, and he's like, "Ah, well done, Optimus. What a pity you've lost." <laughs> so Skyfire comes walking up and Megatron is like, ha ha ha, I'll unleash my big robot on you now. And so he orders him. Skyfire, destroy Optimus Prime. Crush him and all the Autobots once and for all. I take no orders from you. I am an Autobot now. This scene gives me goosebumps every darn time i watch it and i i have it ripped onto mp3 i listen to the episode occasionally when i'm on runs and it gets me every darn time where he says i take no orders from you i know it's cheesy he holds up this autobot symbol that he got from someplace like oh ratchet made it for me Uh, (laughs) ratchet had a sticker sheet in his back pocket that he got from a third party site actually that kind of makes sense because you know if if ratchet's repairing you you know, I think a lot of the damage is going to be done to your decals and such. So ah. probably needed some some new decals whenever he was repairing people. So he was able to slip one to Skyfire here. And I, I like that Skyfire doesn't have it on yet to suggest. Here we are, like, building our own fan. And Ratchet said, hey, you're going to need a new insignia Here's an Autobot one in case you want to use mm. it. Right, it's still your it's still your choice because we're Autobots and we let you have choice. We're not. And how about like this? Megatron. I think you'll like this little bit of fan and I've created. What if he thinks he doesn't quite earn it yet? Oh, so he, not he didn't until put he it stops on Megatron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not until he looks Megatron in the eye and says, "I quit." Right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he comes up and he says, I take no orders from you, rips off the Decepticon symbol, rips it. You see it like tears into pieces, and then he holds up the Autobot symbol and like glows behind it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And then he puts it on his chest, I'm an Autobot now. And then well, Stan Bush music's gonna play now because you're gonna do an awesome fight scene, right, <laughs> Skyfire? No, unfortunately, the animators were all tuckered out from that Prime and Megatron battle, and so <laughs> Skyfire just sort of awkwardly picks up Megatron, and he's not even drawn it as, as twice his height anymore. <laughs> so he, he yeah. throws Megatron into a chunk of ice, and here well, okay, we if, go. If we're, if, 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 if we're rationalizing still... He's not a warrior. So like right. what I like about that too is like this is like guitar solo fight scene moment, right? I put the Autobot symbol on. I'm an Autobot now, but he still kind of sucks at this. Right. <laughs> he picks Megatron up and just throws yeah, him. Yeah, he's still a scientist at <laughs> heart. Like, it's like, how do I get Megatron over there? I guess throw. <laughs> I, I would like a cutaway shot of him just going like, well, that didn't go as awesome as I <laughs> hoped it would go. <laughs> it always looks so much better in the movies. Yeah, like he turns to Optimus like, well, that looked a lot better in my head than it actually did. <laughs> but, but but the Decepticons are ready to protect <laughs> Megatron. Who who <laughs> leaps into battle? I'll tell you who. <laughs> Reflector leaps into battle. Reflector comes running <laughs> at the huge Skyfire, but 
knowing that Skyfire is a huge opponent, two reflector robots are running on the ground and they're balancing yeah. the third reflector robot on their shoulders. So it's like, hey, you think you're so big? They form big? a cheerleader pyramid. <laughs> and it looks adorable. Oh my God. <laughs> Like they they all look perfectly serious about what they're yep. doing. So they they think they <laughs> oh. think they're awesome because hey we're big now too. But they run at Skyfire and he just brushes them off. It, it, again, he's got no fighting <laughs> skill. He just sort of like right. <laughs> waves out his hands and knocks them over. <laughs> they just fall. Down. Yeah. And now Starscream attacks Skyfire <laughs> from the sky. And so Skyfire yeah. remembers that he can actually transform, and he joins Starscream in the sky so they can battle plane to plane. Time to even the score, friend! So, yeah, now everybody, all the Autobots and humans are rooting for Skyfire. You know, the, the Starscream's still leaning on that whole treachery thing. He's like, where are you, traitor? Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to pay for your treachery. If there's one thing he hates, it's treachery. Uh, pot, this is the kettle <laughs> calling to say, you know. But what do they do? Like, do they do, like, some amazing, like, super cool Cybertronian weapons fight? No, somehow Skyfire just can't be seen by Starscream. So I guess he's, like, he's in Starscream's blind spot or something. He's like, where are you, traitor? So they yeah. just, like, fly around, and it's it's not animated spectacularly at all. Skyfire reveals himself, and they start shooting at each other. And they basically end up... They just, like, ram each other. Yeah, they basically end up ramming into each other and sort of clip each other. And they both yeah. sort of go down uh, crashing. Starscream uh, crashes down into the ice. And I don't know if you if you picked up on this, but one of the Autobots whistles. <laughs> 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 they all cheer when Starscream spins out, which I also like. I like the idea of Starscream like crashing into the ground in front of the Autobots, and they're all cheering like "Hooray, you failed!" Because that always sucks. Like if you ever played sports and like you screw up, and the other mm-hmm. team cheers, that's a bad feeling. I, I identified with that, but but one of the Autobots does like the two fingers in the mouth whistle as Starscream crashes, and I want to know who did it. <laughs> Skyfire's a bit damaged too, and he's shooting at the ground presumably to break his fall, maybe to turn some ice into some softer snow to break his fall as he crashes down. I read that as he was trying to cover up that crystal that the the Decepticons were using to drain the heat energy. Oh, okay. That would make sense. Because he's like, just one last blast, and then he shoots, and then like a mountain falls over top of that crystal, but then he crashes right next to the crystal, and then he gets buried along with it. Mm. And so by the time the Autobots get to him, the sad music has already started. Because he's been buried alive again. Yeah. So Skyfire is totally under the ice. We can't really see any part of him. So the, the scene begins with all that all about sadly standing around a green glow in the ice, which presumably is that crystal. But there's these rings of glowing energy that look very similar to Energon Cube energy. What did you read this as when you were first watching it? It just seemed like, like that's Skyfire somehow, or I don't know. It just seemed like... It seemed like they had something in mind specifically because it is like circular rings. But yeah, but. it's concentric rings. When I was a kid, I came to the conclusion that oh, that must be what an Autobot grave looks like. Mm. Like on Cybertron, a graveyard is just all these rings of energy everywhere. Hmm. I mean, I don't think it was that. I think it's just like this is some side effect of the energy crystal that the Decepticons were siphoning like it's refracting through the ice or something I don't know yeah but yeah they're sadly standing around it and then Prime leans down to comfort Spike he risked everything to save us and the earth the energy drain has been stopped the earth will heat up again and the Decepticons are defeated but Skyfire is is gone he won't be forgotten Spike he will live forever so long as freedom exists. We shall remember you, Skyfire. We shall remember. So, I think that is a haunting ending to a single episode of the Transformers. Skyfire died. Yeah, I mean, they don't flat out state it, but they do everything but state it. He said he risked everything to save us and the Earth. 
and they're saying they're going to remember him. So well, he's dead. Spike says Skyfire is gone, mm-hmm. and then Optimus says he'll live forever so long as freedom exists. Okay, well, in other words, you're saying that he's not here; he's right. living forever someplace else. Mm-hmm. Right? There was no, there's no two ways about it. I knew what that meant when I was 11 years old. Mm-hmm. Like he died. Yeah. You know, if this is the last episode of the Transformers, and we never see these characters again, that's a very good ending. That's a very noble. You know, very much a classic literature ending. You know, some character who was not necessarily a hero to begin with becomes a hero mm-hmm. by sacrificing yeah. himself to save the the other good guys. So that yeah. is a fantastic ending to an episode. However... <laughs> it's about to be cheapened. It's about to be cheapened <laughs> so much... This yeah, this yeah. twenty dollar <laughs> twenty dollar ending to the episode is about to become seventy five cents tops. Well, well, somebody somebody at Hasbro went. What are you doing? We got toys to sell. <laughs> <laughs> and, Get back in there and write a story where he's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice we didn't even go into the whole Jetfire Skyfire thing. That thing that's yeah. been explained a million times by now. So if you don't yeah. know. Why the toy was Jetfire and the show was Skyfire? Look it up. But we yep. presume that most Jetfire, people Skyfire listening to YouTube. a podcast like this, especially seven episodes in, we presume you already know. But if you don't yeah. know, there's plenty of resources. Yeah, it's it's only a, a quick internet search away. But yeah, if if they would have left it here, it makes Starscream and Megatron that much worse, mm-hmm. right? Because it's also the story of how an innocent person got tricked and manipulated into having to grow into something more than what he was, but ultimately having to lose his life because of that. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah, it, it, this, I, I got to say, this is probably one of my top five favorite episodes of all time. There's so much that I love about this one. And Skyfire is not the same after this. No. Like he, I, you know, spoilers, he does come back and he's a bit different. And I still like him, but I don't love him the way I do in this one. Right. Like, I love this this story of his character in this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it uh, it says something that the subsequent episodes that he appears in are not written by the same author here. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Oh, I wonder what would have happened mm. if he had written more of the other episodes. Okay. Yeah, it, it also makes me... Like wish like there's a handful of com- uh, episodes coming up that focus on a specific transformer, uh, but not in the way that they have an arc the way Skyfire does in this one. Mm-hmm. Most of the later episodes are just focusing on well, this is what makes them distinct from their fellows. Right. But you know, Hoist goes Hollywood. Hmm. Does he really grow <laughs> at all in that? Oh, Jersey, that's <laughs> a wonderful the character we- arc. <laughs> There's the five stages of grief, and there's... The- <laughs> That's right. It's like Pixar level character <laughs> development in Hoist Goes Hollywood. <laughs> oh, I can't wait till we get to that one. <laughs> oh, so, uh, any other 10,000 foot up uh, observations that you have about this one? Well, like I said, if they could have just left well enough alone, if this was Skyfire's only appearance, it would be a very beautiful story. But... Mm-hmm. It's tainted, so, mm. I mean, it doesn't get tainted for a whopping two episodes from now, but uh, it gets tainted, mm. so yeah, could have been a very beautiful thing, and I can only imagine what the writer of this episode thought. I mean, if he wasn't just viewing it as, oh, that's just some little robot story I wrote as work for hire, you know, if he actually cared about the character he was writing and everything... If he saw the subsequent episode with Skyfire, boy, can you imagine if you were a writer and then you see this other writer follow this up with the next time we see Skyfire? I, as, as somebody who is friends with people who worked on mainstream superhero car- comic characters and even created some mainstream superhero comic characters, uh, it'd have to watch them watch somebody else take <laughs> and run with that idea. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can tell you that it's, it's a mixed bag. It's a super mixed bag. And they all have the sort of uh, 
generic answer, well, it's work for hire, and I couldn't expect that anyone would, you know, it's like, yeah, we know, we know that's your token answer, but tell us how pissed off you are. <laughs> Give us the dirt. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so, so my my guess would be is that a story like this is written by somebody who cares about craft, right? Like, I don't know how much he necessarily cared about the character, but it it seems to me that this person cared about writing a good story for children. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that if it were me, I probably would be a little bummed out that like, oh, so you undid like the haunting (laughs) and and the haunting ending that I wrote. Like, I, I was thinking about that too, is like, well, you know, like talking about death is something that with, with young people, is something that like we often feel like, well, I mean, I, I see this as somebody who doesn't have children, but like historically it was considered a big no, no. You just don't talk about it. Like, mm-hmm. like you don't even use the word death. I will destroy you. Right. You don't say I will kill you. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, in these kids shows, but there's something about presenting, you know, like, yeah, pe- you're, people are going to come in and out of your life and you're going to have to say goodbye to them sometimes. And it's not so it's like the iron giant, right? Like it's, it's bad to kill, but it's not bad to die. You know, like presenting that idea to young people, I think isn't a harmful thing. Mm-hmm. And this story could have been an early example that, well, at least it was for the couple weeks <laughs> I was watching the show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were still a year away from Robotech and farewell, big brother. So that's right. Know, this was yeah. basically one of the, I mean, you never saw anyone die in super friends. This was, right. you know, as as deep as we got at this point. Hmm. Well, whew. Hope the next one's a fun one. What's the next one? SOS Dinobots. Oh my, Dinobots, huh? I thought you were gonna make <laughs> dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the return of Hoover's favorite character. Huffer in the next episode of Four Million Years Later. All right. Well, thank you for this one, Hoover. This was a really fun one. I'm glad we finally got to this one. So until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of Four Million Years Later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Hoover. And I'm not sure if I'm a scientist or a warrior, but I have to find my way in the world now. If only I had a tech spec I could refer to and find out what my function is. Mm, That is too bad. But I know it says courage too. Uh. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mihalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>